Good morning. Good morning, everyone. It, this workshop is really a gathering of friends who are going to learn something together. We are new at this, and I am so happy that you can join a colleague across the Midwest to be here. We have outstanding speakers and presenter, and I hope your day will go well and you will take away the knowledge that could be useful in your operation at your particular university or colleges. We are here to welcome Dr. Gibney. Robin and I were friends in graduate school, and we kept in touch for that, oh gosh, almost 20 years now, um, and she held she has grown in reputation in the area of something I don't know much about. So we are bringing the national expert here, and hopefully myself and every of us go learn together how to leverage what we're passionate about, how we use the resource at the university, leverage additional financial support from corporate private uh, entity that share the same concern of the nation. How do we? How do we broaden the participation of underrepresented minority in the STEM discipline as well as STEM workforce? So I am here so happy to welcome all of you to this workshop. As we mentioned, and Deb have been communicated to you. It is by invitation only, so we didn't advertise it widely, but your travel will be reimbursed, and hopefully you will turn in your travel reimbursement to Deb uh, soon so she can process, because we want to close the book for the LSMCE grant soon. Thank you, and enjoy the day. The hospitality at IUPUI, you see all the construction going because we are growing. So welcome, even though it's a rainy day, but it's going to be fun. Thank you. It's great to be here. I have to tell you that I was recovering from doing a federal grant application at home because um, I had been up way too late the night that it was due. And I was recovering at home and, and sort of licking my wounds a little. And I got this phone call from Kim. And it, it was just kind of fun to, uh, to reconnect on, the, on this level. And, and uh, I'm delighted to be here. And so uh, thank you all for being here. And I, you know, you all have a lot of expertise in federal grants and so forth. I have less expertise in that area, so you all can teach me. And then um, where I do most of my, my um, fundraising is with private and corporate foundations. So, and, and I also am part of a development team, which, which means that I'm, while I don't develop individual relationships for individual fundraising, I am part of that team, and so I'm active in it, and, and actually started out life um, as a development director for the IU School of Nursing. So um, I'm kind of coming home, and it's good to be here. So um, how many of you have done any fundraising with private entities? OK, so we do have some expertise in the room. Good. Um, so this is, this, is, this is my icebreaker. This is, this is my life. My friends think I beg. My mom thinks I'm changing the world. The program staff think I have money on trees. My boss thinks it's as easy as CB, ABCs. I, of course, think, that I, think I'm writing the next great novel. But what I really do is check word count and character count over and over and over again, because most of the grants are online applications these days. Occasionally, so, so while in the federal system you, you, you submit online, 
you get to write the document in, in, in a format that is, you know, like a, you write it in Word and put your pictures in and make it look the way you want it to look. And then you put it in a PDF and you upload it. You have, you have control over what it looks like. That's not generally true with, these, with the private foundation online ones. You get a box. There's no way to put a chart in there. There's no way to put a, a picture in there. There's no way even to put bullets in there. And you get charged extra characters if you want to put a new paragraph in. And so you write what you think you want to write, and then it comes out 200 characters over. So you have to figure out how to say the same amount of say exactly the same thing that you wanted to say before, only in fewer characters. So never use the word utilize. It's way too many characters. Use works just as well, and it's only three. <laughs> I mean, you learn all these little tricks. Another trick, you, you, if you put hyphens between words, so if you're writing out this is if it's a word count instead of a character count. Character count, this doesn't work, but word count, it does. If they're counting words and you want to write out STEM technology, engineering, and math, that's, not, that's four or five words, depending on whether you put the and in there. If you put STEM, parenthesis, and then science, hyphen, technology, hyphen, engineering, hyphen, math, close parenthesis, that's only one word, because the hyphens are in there. <laughs> These are the tricks you learn. But anyway, it's how you survive in this world nowadays. So what I'm hoping that you will come away with on this at the end of this session is an understanding of the overall fundraising landscape, uh, some basic strategies for finding a funder, um, Understanding the importance of relationship building and understanding some techniques for developing key components of a proposal. And understanding how to simplify content and make it reader friendly. So I set this up just for fun as kind of busting myths. So myth number one, the best way to fund most projects is to get a big corporation to support it. Uh, if any of you have had any interactions with board members, I guarantee that most board members think that the best way to get funding for a project from, private, from, from the private sector is to find a corporation and, 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 and get get some big dollars, because, or, or if, uh, you know, or, or go after Bill Gates for, you know, I mean, he's got lots of money, why wouldn't he fund me, right? So there, there's this, this basic misconception that, that the best way to get funding is to go to a corporation. This is the reality of the fundraising landscape. You'll see that 70% of all fundraising dollars comes from individuals. 9% comes from requests, which is really individuals, right? I mean, who makes bequests but individuals? 16% um, is foundations. However, half of that 16% is from donor-advised funds in like a, a community foundation. And donor advised funds are really individuals. So if you add up the 70%, the 9%, and the 8%, you're left with only 13% that isn't from individuals. So While my focus is today is going to be on uh, foundations and, and so forth, the reality is that if, you, if your school or your 
program or your university or whatever has a fundraising arm, and I'm sure they do, um, if you can get to know the people that are working with individuals, there are individuals out there that are excited about STEM. And so where does most of the money come from? It comes from individuals. That's the simple. Um, interestingly, so this is the latest data that just came out last week, I think, is when it came out. It's brand new. Um, and the, the, in IU, the, the Lilly School of Philanthropy is, is part of what makes this Giving USA happen every year. So you're in the, you're in the hub of it all when you're here. Um, but for the last 20 years, the numbers around individuals and foundations and bequests have fluctuated a little bit up and down. Corporations has been flat at 5%. That's because corporations give a percentage of profit. And they're never going to give more than that. So where does the money go? Um, religion has always been the largest chunk, probably because people who go to church every week get asked every week to make a donation. And you know the, the, the one-liner in philanthropy is the main reason people don't give is that nobody asked. So you have to build the relationship, and you got to, but, but, but then you got to make the ask. And if Nobody ever asked them, why would they give? So religion has always been the largest. Um, health and human services come next. Education is one of the big sectors. They, they, get a, they get a good chunk. So that's positive from your perspective. Now that, of course, includes um, all levels of education. So how many of you are working with graduate students? How about undergraduate students? And how about um, secondary, getting up to, to graduate? OK. So, um, so everybody's working with at least undergraduate. And some of you are going beyond that. And some of you are starting in the pipeline area. OK. So all of that would fall into the education. Um, so I've mentioned a couple times that there are different kinds of foundations. Um, private foundations are ones that um, have a standing with the IRS. They are, they, they, and they are required to give away at least 5% of, of, their, um, in, uh, of their income to charity. So they also obviously are paying for you know, salaries and all those kinds of things too. But at least 5% of their, of their income has to go to, to charity. So they are required to give away money. Um, so they want to build relationships with people that want to accomplish what they want to accomplish. And so, and, and that's their job is to give it away. So you're not, you're not, uh, there's no surprise there. It's not like working with individuals where you have to kind of build up to it. They know why you're coming, you're there because you want money and it's their job to give away money and that and the idea is to try to match up the, the interests. So, Private foundations are one, one kind of foundation. Corporate foundations work very similarly to private foundations, except the funding comes not from individuals, but from, corporate, um, from, from the corporate sector. So, so General Motors is a corporation, and there is a General Motors Foundation. Um, Duke Energy is a corporation. There's a Duke Energy Foundation. And the funding for those 
foundations comes from directly from the corporations. They are, they are the source of the funding. And they, they pay it out of their profits. That's how they, how they fund those corporations. Um, community foundations are generally very, only focused on the community where they live. They, so there's no point in going to a community foundation. Um, I mean, if, if I'm in Cincinnati, there's no point in my going to the central Indiana community foundation. It's not going to work because they only fund the area where they are. And what they do is serve kind of as a, 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 a gathering place for people that have an interest in supporting the community, and they kind of pool their resources into this community foundation. And then there's more clout to be able to, to make a bigger impact. Because as an individual, I feel like I can't make that big of an impact. But if I'm part of something bigger, I can really see, see the dial move a little bit. So that's what the community foundations are doing. Um, one of the huge strategies the community foundations uses is the donor advised fund. And I mentioned those earlier. So donor advised funds are funds that I as an individual or as a family want to create an avenue through the community foundation to sort of, it, it becomes my bank, if you will. I bank my philanthropic dollars at the community foundation. And then I can go to the foundation and say, I'd like you to make a grant to this organization on behalf of my donor advised fund. Um, the interesting thing about the donor advised funds is that when I, as an individual, give money to the donor advised fund, that's when I get my tax deduction. When, the, when, the, when I go to my community foundation and say, I'd like to make a grant to that organization, I don't get any tax deduction for that because I already got it when I gave it to the foundation. And the foundation doesn't get tax deductions for making grants because it's in the business of making grants. That's what it does. So when you're working with donor advised funds, sometimes there's confusion on the part of the donor. They think that they should be getting a tax deduction again, and they don't. So you have, and, and the same thing's true if it's a family foundation, which is the next one here. Uh, when it, it, if I give money to, a, to a, a family foundation, then when it goes into the foundation is when the tax deduction happens. So at the end of last year, when people knew this new tax law was going to come in, there was a huge influx of individual dollars into donor advised funds and family foundations because they weren't sure how the new law was going to affect them and they wanted to. T so that's part of the, why there was that huge, huge increase, I think, in donor advised funds last year. We'll see how that continues to play out. But it's become a huge vehicle and it's become actually very controversial because sometimes people are uh, putting money in there and then it's sitting and it's not actually getting out and doing good in the community. So there's, there's, there's some, and, and the other thing is, so I've been talking about donor advised funds in the context of community foundations. There also are donor advised funds in uh, investment firms like Fidelity and Schwab and all those places. And the, they have a huge donor advised fund portfolio also. So all of these things together. Now, I'm going to focus primarily on the private foundations and the corporate foundations. Uh, I do write to family foundations also. Some family foundations function more or less like private foundations. It's just that instead of having a board and program officers, you have a board. The, the trustees are basically the family members, and they make the decisions. Uh, but they have a full application process. Other family foundations function basically like individuals, where you get to know the, the president or the head of the family, and then the, 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 the funding comes basically through a, 
a verbal ask or maybe a, a, a letter or something like that, but it's not a big formal application process. Um, so it depends on the size of the family foundation, whether it functions more like a donor advised fund or like a private foundation. But those are all distinctions that the, the field makes. So how do you find a potential funder? Um, Probably the, the go-to way to do it is to use Foundation Directory Online. They're kind of the Cadillac search engine. And let's see, I have to get to, I, wanna, I know what I want to do, I want to do this. Okay, so this is Foundation Directory Online. It is a private, I mean, it's a subscription service. You have to pay to be allowed to use it anywhere. So my organization pays for me to be able to use Foundation Directory online anywhere. Um, I have my own login, and, um, and I've done that already, just to get to this page. If, you don't, if your organization doesn't, so first of all, check and see if your institution has Foundation Directory Online access and how you might use it. Um, and then if you don't have access to it through your institution, check and see about your public library or some other entity that is public like that. Um, the, in Cincinnati, the, the Hamilton County Pub Public Library that has, is a, a site for Foundation Directory Online. And what that means is that anybody can come in and use it for free. You just have to use it at the branch instead of in your office. I mean, I, I, guess I can log in anywhere because I've got the subscription. But otherwise, and I, I'm guessing that most of, most of the institutions probably have it. So you just need to ask about it. So I get, I get this far. I go to find funding. And this is what pops up. Now, I could put, a, put a, something in here. Um, say I put, I could start to type in STEM, I could put in STEM. And I'll get a hit of 1,380 grant makers that are connected to STEM. That's probably too many to review. And you probably don't want to look at all of those because it would take way too long. So rather than do that, what I advise you do is go over to this, where it says Advanced Search and Filters. And it's not really very highly advanced. So here, let's see, I want to, I want to leave this blank for now. All right. I'm not sure why we're spinning. Let's try going over here and see. All right, well, I'll, let me just talk. So we can put, there are, there's a taxonomy the foundation directory uses. And if you don't use their terms, you'll get zero hits. So if I put down, it's not going to let me do anything for some reason. Let's see. Let's try this. There we go. OK. Um, if you click in that box, you'll, you'll see a taxonomy begin. And any time that there's an arrow down, like I'm going to go to education, then I can see the different kinds. So if, if, for example, you're dealing with support services for your students, you might want to look at education services, college prep, All the, so tutoring, student retention. So you may want to look in there as an area. 
And then you can also look at, I happen to know that this is where STEM is. Under sec elementary and secondary education is the STEM education one. So I might want to do that. And college prep. And student retention. Now, sometimes it's better to just do one at a time, but those are the those are the, the ones that I think probably would be the best fits for most of you. You can play around with it and see what happens. Let's start with, let's see. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take out I'm going to just leave it at STEM. And then ge geographic focus is the focus of where the grant is going. That's important because it's different from location. Location is where the grant maker lives. So why would I want to focus on geographic focus instead of location? Yeah. Right, yeah, they could be somewhere else but making grants in your area. Um, if it's a family foundation, maybe the headquarters is in Arizona now, but the, the family has strong ties to Indianapolis. So you might want, and, and if you look, it, 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 you know, when you get into the, the, the record, you can see that their two priority areas are Arizona and Indiana. So you, ha you want to do, use the geographic focus. There also, if you look, this, this one also has a drop down. I, it's not showing it. It has, it has drop down menus, so you can, you can check it this way. You can go in that way. Um, and one of them is always going to be national. So well, I have to spell it right or it won't work. I can't type today. So just national funding is, is one. And that way you'll catch anybody that gives anywhere in the country. Um, Population served, here you, you, can, you can get age groups, ethnicities, and so on. So you can narrow it that way, too. Um, so let's do, um, we'll do Indiana. And um, just search this way. And instead of getting 1380, I now get 31, which is a much more reasonable number of people to look through. So, and you can do view all here so you can see the whole list. Now, the way this is organized is not from who has the most money to who has the least money, but who is the most likely organization to give you a grant based on their giving history. So the most important figure that they use in, in doing this ranking is really the grant count, meaning they give a lot of grants in this area. So, so this one, Lily Endowment gave away more money, but they only gave seven grants. Lily and Company gave away 23 grants. So they're a better prospect, probably. No, this is total over, over a period of time. That's not, that's not annual. So if I, if I go to, to, if I look at Lilly, which is what I'll do right now. The, 
So this shows you where Lilly gives money. They give money nationally. Um, Indiana gets the most money. But these figures are really not significant necessarily. I mean, you can see that it goes to nonprofits and that, you know, the, the most common grant is around 5,000 and so forth. But the, the most important one is if you go down to the grants section, the orange section, this will tell you that in the field where you're asking questions, the most common grant amount is 25. So if you only ask for five when, they're used, when, when their common one is 25, you're probably not asking for enough. So if you went but to this, if you go to this one, you'd, you'd probably think, well, gosh, I should ask for $5,000, right? But if you go to the one that's for your area, the STEM education area, then you want to think, you think, hmm, I should probably ask for around 25. So, and then this way, this is where you can see how, so I can do view all here. What options? No, I don't want the tour. Um, these are arranged most recent to least recent, and this will be all 23 grants. And then you can see where the, where the grants are going. And you, could, you, can even, um, you can even go in and see that it was to celebrate Science Indiana and Hoosier Science and Engineering Fair. Okay, so they gave money for a fair, and it was $40,000. So you can go in and see that part. And then the other part of this that you can go to is the section that used to be in the in the first part of the profiles, the way they had an old, an old format. But here you can see what their subject um, areas are. So for example, as a, as a museum, even though I might be asking for money for STEM education that the museum is doing, it's nice to see that they like to support some, sort museums too as one of their key areas. Geographic focus, it says Indiana. So while they give nationally, it looks like for STEM, their focus is, is Indiana. And then this, these are your population groups. Down here, these are the different kinds of grants that, that, that organizations might give. General support, programs development, um, you know, if, if it's for scholarships, I mean, these are, these are the kinds of support that you could go to them for that might be relevant. Um, and then this is where you find out about down here, you can find out about the application process. So, Sometimes you'll see this, this line, unsolicited requests are currently not accepted. That doesn't mean you can't go to them. It just means you can't go in cold. So if they don't take unsolicited requests, that means you have to get solicited, right? You have to be asked to submit. So how do you do that? You get to know somebody who then says, so don't let that unsolicited request not, not accepted deter you from thinking that this is a potential funder? Let me give an example. I was talking with uh, U.S.C. Dr. Matthew Hanagow about how to bring professional engineer, IT, into support uh, our initiative of pipeline development. And 
resident of black data professional happened to work at Eli Lilly, and he said, let me find out and get some money for you to host a summit. He just come and asked for 5,000, and we said, are you applied for, and we get funded. Because what we asked was supported by an internal staff of Eli Lilly, and at the meeting, the, the expectation of the foundation and 5,000 is small amount. So we get it approved on the, on the speedy process. They don't have to go to the board. So find someone who can have connection with the corporation. Yep, definitely. And then at the bottom of this is, you know, who's on the board and and where the, where the funding comes from. So, um, so that's a quick overview. There, most of the libraries that have these actually do courses. I mean, you can go and take a course and just basically they'll walk you through it and, and you can ask questions and really get some hands on. But I don't want to spend any more time on that today. Um, So just to round this out and move on to some other things, uh, subscription services, uh, there, are, there are other ones. And some of them are, you, know, you can get for, a re so the foundation center is the, is the foundation directory online. Grant station is another one. There's a bunch of them out there. Um, one of the things that I do is I set up a Google alert. So anytime some, something gets funded by, I, so I have a Google alert for, for STEM education and grant. And, and I get, and I have another one, so I, we have another program called Youth Program, so I'll do youth development and grant. And we have another one for early childhood education, so I'll do early, early childhood education and grant. So you can set, figure out what those keywords are, and you can get a Google alert. And then a lot of it is not going to be useful, but you will sometimes find notices of organizations that are giving to organizations like yours, and that'll give you ideas to go and look. So going back to that screen for the Foundation Directory Online, um, I should show you this. Hang on just a sec. Um, real quick. Uh, let's see. Up here, if I have a specific organization that I want to check out, um, I can just type in the organization's name and get all that information. And it won't be for a specific content area, but you can find out a lot about that organization and find out if they're even giving in your area and that kind of thing. So that's another way to do that. Um, and then Kim, Kim uh, gave you a preview here, but networking is the other way to find potential funders. Just talking to members of your board, or if you haven't, I mean, not necessarily the board of trustees, depending upon where you are in the organization, it might be, you know, an advisory board or something like that. But those are people in the community. And they are connected to other people in the community. And they know people who have funding and that sort of thing. So getting to know the people that are, that are in the, you know, that are in a position to introduce you to funders is, is the other way to find out about funding. Um, and then colleagues, you know, find out where other people are getting funding. And it, it's generally not a matter of, of, of a zero. I mean, to a certain extent, there's only so many dollars that the people are giving out. But, but if there's, you know, there's, there could be collaboration in terms of trying to, to go for, for dollars together. So with number two, you don't need to worry about building relationships for grants. That's just for seeking support from individuals. I think this is one of the biggest myths. Um, 
I think people who don't do grant writing think that what grant writers do is they find an RFP and they respond to the RFP and they send it in and money comes back. And that is not what happens. So the same fundraising cycle that applies for individuals really applies for foundations also. Now, it might look a little bit different because you're not necessarily going to invite them to a party or invite them to breakfast or lunch or dinner or something like that. Uh, foundations are there to give away money, and they don't, they don't need to get to know you personally. That's not the point. But they need to get to know your organization. And so how do they get to know your organization? You have to reach out to them. And that's, so you've identified them through your, um, you've identified them through your, your search process. And then the cultivation phase is when you, they get to know you and you get to know them. You find out that they're interested in this aspect of your program or, um, and they find out the kind of program that you have that might match up with what their, their priorities are. So that's the cultivation process. Solicitation is when you actually send in the, the, the application. Uh, once you get the funding, you need to acknowledge that funding. And even if you don't get that funding, you should acknowledge the fact that you've heard from them. I actually ended up getting a grant from somebody that I got a no from. Now, it wasn't a, a, a direct one-to-one, -one, but I, the, the story is that I, I wrote the grant cold, which I probably shouldn't have done, but I couldn't find a name. And so I just sent it in. And it came back that I didn't get the grant, but I emailed the person back and said, can you, can you let me know what, what the strengths and, and concerns were so that I can do a better job next time. I ended up having this kind of email relationship with this person. And two, two years after that, because of what was going on in my organization, I decided not to apply. I'd applied the year before, but then I didn't apply. And in the spring, I got a notice that I'd received a grant. And I was really confused, because I was pretty sure we'd decided not to apply. So I contacted this person, and uh, she said that they hadn't had enough good applicants, so she'd put in my, my application from the year before. And we ended up getting $15,000. So it, it, it's worth it to say, thank you for reviewing my application. I'm sorry. You know, I, I appreciate your time and energy. Can you give me some tips? Build a relationship even, even with a no. A no doesn't mean that you, you drop the ball. Um, engage is difficult with foundations sometimes, but if you can get them to come on a site visit. So for example, after, after you've, you've gotten the funding, sometimes you can get the program officer or somebody else from the organization to come and participate in part of the program. We have, an organi we have a, a program at, at Cincinnati Museum Center called STEM Girls. And it's for girls 7 to 14. And after we had gotten a grant from, from an organization, I worked with that program officer to get people from her company to come and be volunteers on one of the STEM Girls Day Out sessions. We were all going, the, the girls were all going to an archaeological dig. And so they, they had volunteers that came out and helped with the dig and worked with the girls. And so they got to see it hands on. So that got them engaged in it. Um, and, and this particular funder actually even brought a videographer and took, did, did videos with the girls and with the program people and with the, the volunteers that came and, and created a whole um, package that they could then go back and show at their 
annual or quarterly meeting to all of their employees so that all the employees could see where, where the corporate foundation money was going. So that's the kind of thing that you can do with engagement. Um, and then steward the gift. Uh, if there's a grant report due, you, you send in the grant report. If there isn't a grant report due, you still send in the grant report. I always send a grant report, no matter what. So how do you do it? In person, sometimes, if you can set up a time to meet with somebody, that's great. Uh, phone calls are sometimes the only way I connect with people. They're busy, they're out of town, they're OK with phone calls. Um, sometimes I just know them by email, never met them. Sometimes I meet by email, and eventually we, we get to phone call. And then eventually, maybe I'll actually see the person. But it doesn't always work that way. But you can build a relationship on email. Handwritten notes. Um, I used handwritten notes for thank yous. I tried to um, send a handwritten note, even if it was a no. Um, photos, if you have, you know, sort of good, good photo, you know, action shots of something happening f with your program, and you think that the funder would enjoy having those photos, send them with a handwritten note. It doesn't even have to be a, at report time, just sometime during the year. Let them know you're thinking about them. Don't just have contact with them when you want to ask for money and when you have a report due. Think about ways you can connect with them other than that. Um, news articles, you know, if, if, you're, if your program's been written up in a, in a newspaper article or a campus journal or, you know, anything that is sort of, you know, published, um, send them a copy of it. Say, you know, and particularly if their logo's down there in the corner, you know, send, it, send them a copy and saying, you know, just want you to know that we're spreading the word about how you're helping us. Um, I mentioned a couple of stories, and Kim had a story. Um, the, um, another one that, that, um, I don't know, how am I doing on time? I probably need to, what, when are we due to end? Okay. Yeah. Okay, why don't we, let me, so um, just another story, um, and this is, this is more about um, how much to ask and why the, found, why the relationship was important. So uh, the CEO ran into the uh, primary decision maker of a large family foundation that has very strict deadlines. You, you have to get it in on that deadline, and you have to fill out the form and all that kind of stuff. And uh, he ran into her. She didn't get the word back to me. And by the time things settled down, we had missed the deadline. But he had said to her, you know, Museum Center needs to be asking for money from us. So the, the history here is that we had gotten a huge bequest from the family that was associated with this. And we had been told, you know, take a break. You just got this huge bequest. We're not giving you more money right now. So he saw her and said, you guys need to start coming back to us. So OK, file that one away, miss the deadline. The next year, um, I had gone through the deadlines, or gone through the, the guidelines, and decided that support for um, disadvantaged students coming to, for, for um, field trips to the school, to, to the museum, was a good fit. And so, I wrote for $15,000 to support that program. And then the following year, we had now gone into 
uh, the silent phases of a capital campaign. And one of our board members knows this other, the, this foundation's um, decision maker quite well. And he told me, you need to ask not for 15, but for 500,000. I would never have asked for 500,000 on my own. But he said, you need to be asking for a lot more. So the CEO had another meeting with the decision maker from the foundation. He confirmed that $500,000 for a capital request was reasonable, and we got it. So that's the power of the relationships. Not only who you talk to, but how you, um, you know, how much to ask and those kinds of things. So let's um, take a break and then we'll come kind of dig into the proposal itself a little bit. I, I hope the second part of the morning will be more, more exchange of idea and uh, their case study. But before we do that, I would like for each of us to introduce ourselves, what background we, and what we are looking for in this kind of workshop. It's going to be quickly run through. But before I'm speaking about myself, I want to add something about the speakers, the presenter. I knew Robin when she was the chair of the English department and English and communication at Martin University. She came to graduate school with a solid grand writing skill, and I thought, oh my gosh, she is graduate from Brown University in English, get a degree, master degree from NYU, and being chair of the English and Communication Department. She got to be the master of all trade in writing and affecting people by convincing people in writing what she wants. So, I want to assure you that she know exactly what she's talking about because she had the background that overwhelmed me when I know about Robin. I knew Robin, as I said, when we were in graduate school together and she had been successfully helped the School of Nursing Dean raise thousands, millions of dollars to get the school repositioned uh, before she left. Uh, Indiana University. So I am, since Robin left university, I have grown myself to be more of grant management, grant writing, and work predominantly with underrepresented minority students because it was a topic of my dissertation. I was studying the pathway, the leakage of the pipeline in STEM. And because of my study, I said, I got to do something about this. And I had a skill set. And I was the assistant dean in the School of Science then. So my dean were very supportive of me in doing this work for over 20 years now. So Kim Nguyen, I am holding probably $15 million active grant right now um, with four, five of it from National Science Foundation, a couple, one from NIH and one from others. So I am staying with the university for a little longer in order to see if we can establish a real true pipeline for the STEM a student to navigate and graduate from IUPUI. This is our focus, and I am very passionate for it. Deb's about to be having a, the microphone around, and she will introduce others. Oh, man. So Derek Tillman Kelly, I'm at The Ohio State University, but I serve as director of the UIA Fellows Program and Network Engagement for the University Innovation Alliance. Um, which is 11 large public research universities across the country um, collaborating to ensure student success. Uh, and I also sit on the state of Ohio's state attainment goal committee for the Ohio Department of Higher Ed. 
Uh, I'm Chris Anderson. I'm a biology professor at Dominican University uh, outside of Chicago. Um, and um, I've been working on a couple of um, different NSF grants that I'm really interested in trying to bring in corporate partners and how to get that started. Good morning. My name is Donna Stallings. I'm from Lincoln University um, in Jefferson City, Missouri. Um, I currently serve as a PI on three different grants for our university. Um, I've written grants uh, through NSA to host a Math for Girls Day for the last 10 years. Um, I have just finished in an NSF grant, HBCU Up, uh, just ended last year. And I'm currently the PI uh, for the Missouri LSM. And then I have a grant that will be ending actually September 30th through Department of Energy, which is a consortium for advanced manufacturing. It's an engineering physics pipeline grant. And then I also have a private funder through a bank, and we support internships for undergrads. Hi, I'm Robin Reilerstam. I'm a biologist from Benedictine University, also outside of Chicago. And um, I'm interested in, in expanding my repertoire of grant writing to not just be research grants for my own purposes, but be institutional grants. Hi, I'm Janice Blum. I'm Associate Vice Chancellor for our graduate school here at IUPUI and at Indiana University, and also have an appointment at Purdue. And I'm also the director of a, a med student summer research uh, program that's funded by the NIH. Hi, I'm Farrah Williams, and I'm the director of the Kentucky West Virginia LSAMP program. And I've been there for two and a half, three, two and a half years, and previous to that, I was in the Oklahoma Alliance. I'm Barbara Fink. I'm the Alliance Director for the Ohio L LSAMP Alliance at The Ohio State University. Hi, I'm Etta Ward. I'm the Assistant Vice Chancellor for Research Development here at IEPUI. And I, from the jump, when I came here about 16 years ago, have been working and supporting and collaborating with units who have um, programs that you all uh, support. We also support these programs here on the IEPUI campus. I'm Linda Brasdell. I'm from Loyola University of Chicago. I'm the director of their Center for Science and Math Education as well as on their uh, chemistry faculty. Um, we have grants um, from foundations as well as from um, NSF, and we run um, numerous K-12 programs, particularly around NGSS and Common Core Math, and um, we have an HHMI grant to uh, look at undergraduates, particularly underrepresented groups in STEM, and we are looking now to be able to continue that program beyond the HHMI. Hi, I'm Rasha Abed. I'm from Valparaiso University. I'm the Associate Director of Sponsored Research. So I work with faculty. Linda, I know you. We saw each other recently. Um, I work with faculty to develop and submit all kinds of grants. Primarily, it's federally funded, um, but we do a lot of foundation grants also. We have several NSF grants that aim to improve STEM in different areas. And we're looking to hopefully submit an LSAMP proposal in August with Linda. Hi, I'm Laura Lynn Cozy. I'm a biology faculty at Illinois Wesleyan University in Bloomington, Illinois. And um, I have very little experience outside of NSF in terms of grant writing. But we have a summer bridge program that's been internally funded for the last few years, and I'm really curious to see if we can find other ways of funding that program. So. Hi, I'm Dick Fulce. I'm the Director of Grants and Foundation Relations at Illinois Wesleyan University with Laura Lynn. Um, and I am uh, excited to say that I can certify everything Robin has said is true and very helpful. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Janet Antwi from Ohio Dominican University. I'm a faculty member in chemistry and we just became partners of LSMCE and I'm proud to learn about other funding opportunities outside of NSF and NIH, the traditional ones that we know. 
Hello, Andrea Porras Alfaro from Western Illinois University, and I am biology faculty, and I also coordinate our RISE program. Uh, this is a research program for undergrads and grad students that got inspired because we came to the first meeting of LSMC, and it's all funded with uh, private donors. Good morning, my name is Matt Calhoun. I'm an assistant professor of civil engineering at the University of Alaska Anchorage, and I work with the Alaska Native Science Engineering Program um, since 99 when I was a student, <laughs> and now I'm an em employee. <laughs> uh, good, hello everyone, my name is Norman Bent. I'm um, the uh, director for pre-college program initiatives at the University of Detroit Mercy. I'm brand new, so this is just my third week. And um, I'm putting the mouth wolves here, I'm just kidding. But I've had a lot of experience in different universities working in different grants. I um, also worked in nonprofit sector for many years, um, working with found community foundations, family foundations. And But I appreciate a lot of what you said, um, because a lot of it is true, too. Uh, and, um, but um, trying to learn more in terms of where University of Detroit Mercy is going. We have a lot of STEM initiatives, um, summer programs, as well as year-round programs through an NIH, as well as NSF grants. And I'll, I'm currently working on a couple grants through Ford Foundation and, and the Skillman Foundation. So I'm so, um, trying to learn as much as I can right now. But thank you. I'm Mike Weintraub. I'm a professor of ecology at the University of Toledo in Ohio. Um, I'm here uh, in two different capacities. I serve as the graduate admissions coordinator for my department, and we have a lot of work to do for broadening participation. And in this context, I'm hoping to find some support for recruitment activities and travel support for recruitment weekend, and I'm also the president of a small scientific society, the Soil Ecology Society, and I'm responsible for organizing the next conference, and I'd like to find some support for enhancing participation from underrepresented groups in our society and our meeting. Uh, I'm Leslie Burhan. I'm an associate professor in mechanical engineering at University of Toledo, and also the interim assistant dean for diversity, inclusion, and community engagement of my college. Um, so, uh, within engineering, we're fortunate that we have a pretty strong corporate partner network. Um, so we do have um, uh, some funding coming in that way. We have a couple pilot programs that I'm running that are funded um, through BP and Dana, but those are just pilots. So I'm just interested in how do we um, build a more sustainable uh, you know, sort of uh, funding uh, network for, for some programs that we can actually offer. Um, not just for one year. Uh, and also, um, as far as uh, our, we have a pretty, you know, the College of Engineering has a pretty uh, strong uh, connection with the foundation, the UT Foundation, and I have applied for some private funding like GM, et cetera, but they're basically the, the foundation person that said, hey, there's this, so I'd like to know how, to, how I can identify those on my own um, and kind of be more directed uh, and more focused in, in, in trying to fund the programs that I want to uh, implement. Morning, everybody. I'm Tabitha Hardy, and I'm the Assistant Dean for Academic Affairs and Student Development here at IUPUI. Um, and we're always interested in learning about innovative ways that we can help our students. And um, I'm also the director of our Preparing Future Faculty Program, so it's always helpful to figure out where the money is. I'm Gabby Klein. I'm an undergraduate student um, working on the evaluation here with Tony. My name is Tony Chase. Uh, I'm the evaluation and research specialist for our STEM Education, Innovation, and Research Institute. Um, I'm also associate faculty with the Department of Chemistry. Um, and uh, my expertise is both in uh, chemistry as well as educational psychology. I'm doing the external evaluation for uh, this workshop. Thank you all, that was really helpful. Um, I, I hear <clears throat> one theme that comes through is not just finding funding, but finding funding that can sustain. And that, that is a challenge with foundations sometimes. There are foundations that will say, 
we'll only do it for a year for, or two years or something. We, we came up across that with the American Honda Foundation. Um, they gave us a really good chunk of funding for our youth programs and then um, after two years said you can't come back because they were wanting to go on to the next shiny thing. And so you do come up against that problem sometimes. On the other hand, there are foundations and uh, that I have, I've been at Cincinnati Museum Center for six years now and I have written a grant to some foundations every single year. And it's almost like putting in the check request because they are so committed to what we're doing and they're so familiar with what we do. And it's, it's, it's sort of like they've put us in their budget and we know we're gonna get it. Um, so it works both ways. And again, it has to do with that, going back to that relationship piece. So let me, um, sure, absolutely. I'm sorry, you talked about how you went from 15,000 to what, 500,000? Yeah. How did you readjust and modify what you were going to use those funds for and justify having the funds? Uh, well, in this case, it went to a capital. Okay. Oh, okay. So that's why it, that's. I don't think on a, if I were doing an operating request that that would have happened, but it was my point in the story was more that it was through our board member who knew us and knew this funder that our CEO was told to go back and negotiate a higher thing given the fact that we were he heading into this capital campaign. So, yeah, that's a that, good question, yeah, because that was a big jump. <laughs> so, um, when, you, when you submit a private application, if it's not online, this is, these are sort of the pieces that you would have. A cover letter, an executive summary. If it's a really short application, I mean, if it's only like three to three to four pages, I wouldn't do a whole page for executive summary. I'd do an intro paragraph. So the executive summary should be uh, proportionate to the size of the whole grant. If you have a, you know, a 10, 15 page application, then, a, you know, a one page executive summary might be appropriate, but I certainly wouldn't do a whole page if, if it's only going to be a short application. But there should be some sort of summary right up front so that the, the funder knows exactly what, what the question is and, and how much you're asking and all that kind of stuff. So executive summary, organizational information, statement of need, project description, evaluation, and budget. Those, those are pieces that are gonna be in every application. They might even call it something different, but they're gonna be in every application. Now, the trick is, this is the order in which you submit it, this is the order in which I recommend you prepare it. So start with your organizational information because this is probably something that you could, that either your fundraising arm has a like a boilerplate of some kind or you can create one and have it available for every application. So you can knock this part off fairly easily. Um, I generally try to tailor it to the program a little bit. So if I'm talking about, if I'm applying for an application for, for the STEM girls program, I'm going to make sure that I mention how that fits into the overall organization somewhere. Um, and if I'm doing it for youth programs, I would do it for them. So I, you, you want to tailor it a little bit so it's not going to be identical, but there are certain things that are always going to be the same. Your, you know, your mission statement, your vision statement, your, you know, um, in my case, I have to take up this much space talking about all the organizations that are part of Cincinnati Museum Center because we have three museums, an Omnimax theater, and um, a, a nature preserve, 
a collections and research center, and then we also have a, a big space that that's, can accommodate all the big traveling exhibits. So I got to talk about six, six different things just trying to introduce who I am as a multi-museum complex. And we're all under one roof. So it's, it's, it's a pretty amazing place. But it takes up a while. And I know I'm going to have to list those, because people don't know who we are otherwise. So organizational information, get a boilerplate, tailor it. But that's pretty easy. Your project description, <clears throat> If you have a project and you know what it is you're doing, um, you know, what, what are we going to do is, is your basic description of, of the, the and, and you can do this like in a bullet form to begin with. But um, then the statement of need, and we're going to talk some more about this, but that would be the, <clears throat> excuse me. That would be the next thing to do. <clears throat> and then your budget. And everything that you mention in your budget should be mentioned in your proje project description. And everything that you mention in your project description should be mentioned in your budget. <clears throat> and I don't know why my voice has decided to go away. Um, so. There should be this absolute correspondence. And anybody who's done federal grants understands this. Um, you know that you have to make those things match up. Um, valuation next. And the executive summary is, is the second to last thing, and the cover letter is the last thing you do. So let's. Talk about what goes into an organization description a little bit. I mentioned this already, name, name of the organization, mission and vision statement. A little bit of history, doesn't have to be a lot. You need to mention who you serve, um, some of your major programs, primary activities. And, and remember, this is for your or full organization, not just for your program. Um, it's always good to talk about what makes you special. I mean, this is your chance to be a cheerleader for your organization. Um, I mean, I, I, I can say that Cincinnati Museum Center is in the top 20 uh, of, of, in terms of the number of visitors per year for the, for the entire United States. That's, a, that's something to tout. That's something that makes us stand out a little bit. Um, we're the largest cultural uh, facility in the Kentucky, Indiana, um, Ohio region, in that southwest corner there. And so, you know, those, the, uh, we, we contribute $114 million in economic impact a year. You know, those are all things that I can tout that, that say we're, we're a really big, special place. Um, and then, Accomplishments, if you've gotten awards, if you've gotten recognition, um, if you've been um, selected to do certain things, you know, those are all things that you can put into this to show that you are <clears throat> really at the top of your game and that you're, you're, you're somebody that can really make this happen. And then some places really want to know the, the number and the capacity of your staff. Sometimes that's a separate question. but. You know, just to know that, it, you know, whether it's an organization that has five, I mean, there are, there are museums that are historic houses that have like five people in them, and we've got 250 employees. So, you know, just difference in scale there. <clears throat> so this is where we get into some of the, um, I, I think there, there's the idea in, in some places, and I, I doubt that this is true in this room, but there's, there's the idea in some places that you can kind of write, a, <clears throat> write up a generic proposal for your program, and then you can just change the name of the funder and send out a whole bunch of them. And 
that generally is not the most effective way to do it. Now, it's true that once you have re written one proposal, it's easier to write other ones. But that doesn't mean that you're going to just change the name. You've got to change more than that. So <clears throat> these are sort of my, my key points on, on the proposal pieces. It should be donor-centric. Um, if you go to your fund, funder's website and you see the language that they are using to describe what's important to them, echo that back. It's not that different from doing federal ones. When you, when you go to the guidelines and you see what the priorities are, you echo those back. So they know that you know what's important to them. <clears throat> and then if we take a minute on the handouts, I didn't want to do slides on these because they were, <clears throat> they're much too wordy for a slide. But on page two of the handouts, The other thing is to, in the sense of it being donor-centric, remember that you're writing to a person. Yes, the funding's coming from the organization, but people are going to read this, and people are going to get interested or not interested in what it is you're doing. So I pulled a couple of samples. They're not perfect. Um, you all probably have wonderful examples yourselves, but there are some here that you can just look at as ways to connect your reader right away with what's important. So I've mentioned our youth programs a couple times already. Um, the first one is, is a, uses the, the technique of a participant quote and then a really quick description of what, you know, an, like, like sort of an executive summary of the program, the same as you, as you had like an organizational summary. Now you're going to have a program summary before you get into the details. So it uses this idea of um, a youth program member who talks about how shy she was when she started out and how this program has, made, has turned her life around, and, and she wasn't thinking about being, science, being in science, and now she is. Um, we have other quotes from the, about students who come in and had never dreamed that they could go to college. And as a result of the program, they're, they're now applying to college, and they're looking forward to it. So the, that idea of qu using a quote, it should be short should not be, it should be, you know, just really kind of capture the essence. But that's one way that you can do a hook. Um, <clears throat> another way is to just do a short storytelling. So in this case, the story is, is basically walking them, walking, walking your reader through an experience. Um, and this, this is a, a, a one of the, th um, exhibits in the Museum Center. So <clears throat> just to give you a little bit of background, the Museum Center is in a, <clears throat> it's in a, um, an Art Deco train station that has been converted into this multi-museum complex. So it's all 1930s Art Deco stuff. It's really a cool building. It's, it's actually this, the largest half dome in, in North America. Um, and so it's this spectacular building but it was literally falling apart from the inside out because of structural issues. And so we've been closed for two and a half years while they're doing restoration. And we're getting ready to move back in and we're raising money to you know, make sure that the exhibits that we were able to shelter in place are up to speed. And then we're putting in new exhibits in other places where we had to take everything out. So, the public landing is one of these exhibits that was sheltered in place. And it's an immersive experience where you actually walk on cobblestones and there's a steam, there's a, there's a river boat with, with water and storefronts and that, that kind of stuff. And so what are we going to do to make this not just 
the same thing it was, but how to make it make it more exciting. And that's that's essentially what we're doing here. But so the idea here was, you know, what does it feel like? What does it sound like? What does it smell like? You know, just get the idea of this immersive experience. So that sort of storytelling is and I'm sure you all have stories of students who came in and you know lives were turned around and that sort of thing. And so those are the kinds of stories that I think uh, it really makes a difference in terms of, of, of people remembering. And people, uh, one, of the other, one of the other techniques I've used is um, to use little pull-out quote boxes. You know how, I mean, research shows that in terms of like a magazine article or a newspaper article or something like that, people read the headline, the subhead, the pull-out quote, and the picture captions. And if those four things work, they might read the article. That's, that's the research. So what can you do? And, and if the first paragraph in the article is interesting, then they'll read the rest of it. You know. So this is like your first paragraph. This is like your, this is how you get people's attention. And, uh, and it's just really important to remember that, that there are people reading all of these. And you want to make it fun and interesting for them. Any ideas or questions that people want to share that you've used? I saw some head nodding over here. Yes. How important, how important is it to provide data? So like I'm guessing your youth programs, you've had them for several years. Mm -hmm. Do you, not, not in the opening section, but do you say we've tracked the students that have gone through this program and we know, for example, that, you know, 20% of them have, are doing this or some, something right, in that yes. sense? Yes. So. The first thing is to make sure it's donor centric. The urgency piece is why should why should the funder care about me now? What's important? You know, what why is this important? In essence, this urgency piece is going to translate into your need statement. It's why this needs to happen. That's why it's urgent, right? We're going to talk more about need statements, so I'm not going to do a lot on that now. Impact, the so what factor. So that's where we get into some of the data, where we can say, we can, we can say that over 25 years, over 1,600 students have graduated from our program, and 99% of them have gone to college, even though about a third of them were considered at-risk students when they came in. We can say that 54% of the students are students of color. So those are all things that, that we talk about. A lot of times there, there will be a section in, a, in, in an application where it talks about the audience you're serving, and you can talk about those pieces. But clearly the impact is, is exactly what you're talking about, and yes. So some, some of the storytelling is one way to do impact. The data is another way to do impact. Research shows that people remember stories more than they remember data. Stories paint pictures, and data is, is dry. numbers. Is numbers and, and people don't remember numbers. They might remember a couple of big ones. I mean, the 100% 100% number, I can say that 100% of my youth program's participants graduate from college, or graduate from high school. That's, 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 that's a number you can remember. Where do you get that data? Where do we get the data? Yeah, how do you track? How are you able to track the students that are in your program after they are out of your program and graduate or go to college? How do you? get that data. But we get, we get the pro, we, we, the 100 percent is graduate from high school. And they're in our program 13 through 18. Okay. So 
we, so we, there, there, there are students up to when they graduate from high school, when they leave to go to college, we can say 99% of them enrolled and went to college. We, cannot, we have not been successful at tracking how many of them completed college. But, but you have them as seniors, so that's how you yes. get it. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that's how we get it. Now, for our STEM girls program, which is for seven through 14-year-olds, that's, you know, that, that one, I don't know that we could, we could get that data. Um, yeah. Um, clarity is my other piece. And I've got another couple of things in, the, in your handouts. These are tools that I use, and you're welcome to use them. Um, but it forces you to really put things down. So I'm on page three of the handouts now. It forces you to just put things down succinctly and really answer the key questions. And I don't need to read through the questions for you. Uh, we could take a couple of minutes if somebody, if people want to just look through it and see if they have questions about what, what the question is, is asking for. But I don't want to read to you. I find that insulting. Are those all pretty straightforward? OK. Um, another tool, and this is uh, the next page in your handouts. And it, this is kind of a quick version of it. But I have found this really useful as a, a grant professional working with people who are not grant professionals to try to get them to think about the kinds of questions I have to be able to answer in order to write a good grant. So they can tell me what they want to do. You know, we're going to do these classes, we're going to do, run these programs, that kind of stuff. They're pretty good at telling me that. That's column one. I need to know who's responsible for it so that I can make sure that I have all the key people in my bios section or my, my staff you know, section where I talk about the quality of the people who are going to be running the program. Um, how long will it take? What resources are needed? And what's the related cost? So if I sit down with a program person at the very beginning, I can begin to build my budget from the very beginning with something like this. Because they want to tell me that we're going to have a, um, some sort of opening event to get students and families interested in what this program's about. Well, I want to know who's going to plan that event and why, you know, how, so when, when we talk about how long will it take, a lot of times you have to have a timeline in an, app, in an application, or at least talk about implementation strategies. So yeah, if the event's going to be on June 1st, then how long does it take? I mean, when do, we, when do we send out the invitations? When do we get the place booked? When, I mean, there are all these pieces that go into that one activity, right? That, those are the kinds of things that you have to spell out in that column to really understand what the process is. And then um, what are the resources? So I might have to rent tables. I have to get a caterer. I have to do, you know, what are the things? I have to have AV. I have to do all these things. Um, Deb can talk to you about all the things that go into setting up this, right? So this didn't start. This, so the phone call that I got from Kim was in February. So. <clears throat> you know, how long did it take to get to today? So those kinds of questions. And then what's it going to cost? How much, are, how much are the tables? How much does it cost to rent the room? How much? All those kinds of things. So now you're already starting to build your budget. 
So I find this really helpful. Um, and if you know all those answers because you're writing the grant application and you are the program person, um, you don't have to pull teeth to get them out maybe, but it's just a good way to try to think about the level of detail that, that's useful so that you have a really clear application. You know, you can communicate to your funder that you know exactly what's involved. You know that, that how long it takes to put together something like this for it to be successful. So that's just another tool, yes. I don't know how much time you have left, but let me share my thought with you on this um, and at this point of the workshop. The table plan project planning workshop work perfectly when you have a collaborative project. That means you have more than one university work together. Whoever going to co-PI with you, you make sure they are doing this same exercise. If, if the, the result of collaborative work indicate they a cohesive and shared goal for your project, that means you have a true collaborator don't collaborate with people by asking, you want to be part of my grant. You need to talk to them first about what you want out of it, how you don't do it, what the timeline, and do you have resources and so on to help you to formulate a collaborative project. Most of, um, I am speaking from the National Science Foundation project and the future of national science funding. When the national science funding includes its introduced, the intention is not one single institution can make a difference. They want a group, the LSM, the same way. It's an alliance. You all have to buy in the same share goal for the project. But don't just ask them to be your partner. Ask them how you contribute to deliver this share goal because you're not going to put people on your grant just because they want, they want that on their CV. You need to make them work with you in concert with you by prepare that timeline matrix, you really need to, to do that exercise before you formalize your group of collaborative work. And it's happened the same way. If you're seeking, uh, seeking private funding, I have been thinking a lot about how we get private funding for the stuff that National Science Foundation don't want to do, such as recruiting up and up the pipeline. They want you to make the student who talented, successfully admitted to your program graduate. That's a given. You know, you cannot really open the pipeline by not having prepared students from K-12 to go into university and have SAT of 1,200. You need to prepare from the pipeline. So private funding is really going to be the sort of helping you to open up that pipeline. You have summer camp, you have map, math preparation, you have chemistry for fun, whatever engage a student so you can admit them instead of just prepare those who already been admitted to graduate. So that's my, my, my thought about it. And Robin has give you the tool set that you can apply to federal grant as well. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so the needs statement. I'm, I, I'm afraid I've talked too long on other things and I have run, I'm going to run out of time here. But um, the, the needs statement needs to connect. First of all, the, the, you're not describing the project's need for funding. That's not the need. 
The need is you have a mission to fulfill, right? The foundation has a mission to fulfill. Those needs meet. And it's very important to talk in your needs statement from the community perspective and not from the project perspective. So I could say that um, from, from the project perspective, the STEM Girls Program has serves about 1,200 girls a year. And we have a waiting list. And we need money to hire more staff to be able to expand the program. That's from my perspective. That's the, the organization's perspective. The need statement doesn't talk about that need. The need statement talks about the community's need for more women in STEM careers. And in order to have more women in STEM careers, research shows you have to start engaging girls in middle school at the latest. Because by high school, a lot of girls have either decided or not decided whether or not they're going to do science. So the need statement is going to revolve around this societal need to have more diversity from the perspective of gender in, uh, in, in STEM careers. And then there's also the need for um, outside activities that promote STEM because the research shows that STEM competency in the, in the public high school isn't, isn't hitting the mark. So we need to find ways to stimulate it outside of the, the high school or, or the, the grade school. And so does that distinction make sense that you're talking about the need from the community's perspective, not from the organization or the, the uh, pro project perspective? And it's really important to make that distinction. Because I think people who don't write need statements a lot uh, st kind of start out with what we need. And that's we want to talk about what the community needs, that the foundation and the organization together can meet that need. With your funding and our expertise, we can meet this need is kind of the formula that you want to use. Um, a lot of times people talk about starting using a funnel approach, you know, starting with the national st statistics um, of, you know, this is the situation nationally. We know that, you know, US students don't score as well with other Western developed nations when it comes to STEM topics and so forth. So we have this national problem, then we have a regional problem, and then we have local problems. So I can, I can funnel it from you know, what, what you know, national organizations are saying down to what's the Ohio school report card for Cincinnati public schools. And you can funnel it down that way. Uh, funders like it when you bring it. I mean, it, if you don't have local statistics, use the national ones. But if you can get local statistics, it's always going to be more powerful. Because the funders are, are local for the most part. Or, and your program is local for the first, most part. So you want to focus in on what you can do to make a difference where you are. So you want to funnel it down towards the local. Um, I've got, in, the, in your handouts, I've got a couple of examples. Um, the first one sort of takes that national to, to local. So we go from, from the national statistics to the Ohio statistics to the um, Cincinnati public school statistics on, um, on graduation rates. And part of what youth programs at Cincinnati Museum Center does is 
promote high school graduation, and it's a college prep program. And it does it by engaging students as volunteers in the museum so that they learn how to do customer service and do demonstrations on the floor and all that kind of stuff. And then in addition to all the, the out in the, with the public stuff, they also have events that are just for the youth. They meet mo monthly and they, they, do, they do trips to visit colleges. Um, there are students that, that say they've never been on an airplane before when they do their first college trip with the, with the youth program. So, you know, you're, you're making, you're providing opportunities to students that they wouldn't otherwise have. So, but the, the, needs, the needs statement is showing how the, the uh, graduation rate is an issue, and it's particularly an issue for students of color and low-income students and so what are we doing to, to counter that? Then there's, there's some research about the importance of the kind of experiences that youth programs provides, those mentoring, those one-on-one, -on -one, out of school kinds of experience and how important those are. And, and, uh, and then there's some, some research on the importance of museums as a, as a spark for interest in, in uh, and, so, and so those are all things that you can, um, that, that's kind of that funnel. The, the second one actually starts local and goes out, so it kind of does a reverse funnel, but um, in terms of just sheer writing style, short sentences are more impactful than long sentences. So if you want to grab somebody's attention, make your first sentence short. So the first one is, Greater Cincinnati needs effective STEM education. That's all. Just grab their attention. This is the issue, right? And then, you know, how do I know that? So I, I we talk about an organization that says, you know, we have this high need. In contrast to that, we have these poor scores. This is our situation. How do we deal with it? Well, these are ways that show that there, there are things that we can do to make it better, right? So my intent was actually, at this point, to let you all spend some time doing some, some writing, but I'm not sure that we're going to have time to do that. So I think what I'll do is kind of plow ahead, and maybe we'll see if we can do that hands-on stuff at a different time. Um, so we were talking, Kim and I, when we were planning this, we were talking about goals and objectives and outputs and outcomes and impacts and indicators. and um, these terms get thrown around, and different funders use them differently. So, so my first piece of advice is make sure you read what the funder means, because somewhere in the, in the application, it'll probably give you details about all of this. So uh, make sure that you, you read carefully. But again, if you all have done federal things, you probably are much more adept at this than a lot of people that come into grant writing. So um, just know, I think the biggest thing is, how many, how many of you are familiar with logic models? Have you all done, you done logic models? No, OK. So I, I think a lot, logic models, there were some grant writers that absolutely hate doing logic models. There are some funders that require you have one, and there are others that don't require it, but it's generally a good idea to do it as a, as a supplemental document if that's an option, just because it spells it all out on one, one page. Um, but here's, here's just some basic terminology, and hopefully, and I, I, this is actually, I, I went ahead and put this into a, um, 
uh, one of the handouts too, on page seven. I took our STEM girls program and just put it in, a, in really brief terms, the kinds of things that you might include in each of these categories. So the, goals, the goal is the general statement of change that you seek to make in response to the need. So we need more women in, in STEM careers, and girls tend to drop out in middle school. So what I want to do is excite girls in middle school about the idea of maybe having a STEM career. So that's my goal, right? Objectives are what I'm going to do to accomplish my goal. So I'm going to engage girls in hands-on learning activities and problem solving to increase their interest and competence in studying STEM. And I'm going to expose girls to different women in STEM careers to increase their awareness of STEM career options. The um, important, you've probably heard this acronym before, many of you, but your objectives should be SMART. They should be specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and timely. So specific, uh, what am I going to do? Who am I going to reach? Measurable. I can measure how many girls I engage, right? That's a measurable thing. I can measure how many programs I'm going to provide. That's a measurable thing. Um, attainable, if, if I were to say in my goal that I want, a, you know, I want, if, if, if I said that my objective was to have girls become STEM career women, that's not something that I can do. It's not attainable for me as a museum, because it's out of my control. So you want to put into your objectives things that you have control over. Um, realistic, you know, can I, can I have all girls come to every program? Probably not. That's not realistic. Can I have programs every single weekend, given my staffing? No, that's not realistic. So what's realistic? And then timely, the, the easiest way to do that is, is to say, and I didn't put it down in this because it, it comes up later, but to, the timely piece can be within the grant period. Outputs are those countable activities and products and participants. How many programs did I give? How many participants came? Uh, if you're creating a, a handbook, if you're creating a movie, if you're creating uh, a curriculum, whatever it is you're creating, those products that will live beyond the grant, that's, that's measurable. And then in outcomes and impacts are the benefits that accrue to the people that have participated. So I can measure the, the number of times that I give a program, but that doesn't tell my funder how that made a difference, right? So the impact is what made a difference in somebody's life. So it you would phrase it as things like, the participants will say, think, know, feel, demonstrate, whatever. And so it's not, we will give X number of programs. That's not an impact. Um, if you look at the handout on page seven, so I've set up in the objectives, girls, I'm going to engage girls age 7 to, 7 to 14 at number one. Okay, then the outcome 
is that I want participating girls age 7 to 14, they will feel inspired to learn more about STEM topics. They will know more about different types of STEM careers. That's something I can measure through a survey. At the end of the program, I can ask them, you know, what did you learn? Would you like to find out more about this topic on your own? Um, you know, how, how, what do you think of the, the speaker that was the, the, the career STEM woman that was doing the presentation? Those are all things that I can ask. So that would be my outcomes. The indicators are those measurement things that you have to come up with. So at least 89% of the 1,200 girls participating in monthly programs report increased interest in learning more about the topics presented. That's where you get down to what the evaluator is going to do. I should have Tony come up and tell this part. <laughs> Tony, of you can critique it. Any, any ideas here? <laughs> OK. Um, and then the impact, generally they want to know about short-term impact and long-term impact. So the short-term is that more girls are motivated to study STEM. And the long-term impact, we hope, but I'm probably not going to measure this. In fact, I know I'm not going to measure this, is more women in STEM careers, because now we've gone back up to what our need was. So we've gone full circle. Does that all make sense? OK. I think those terms can be really frustrating to people if they haven't um, come across them. And then you start getting confused about what they all are. Um, you also have this logic model in your handouts. There are lots of different versions of a logic model. I happen to like this one. So the situation is essentially a one sentence, what's the, what's the need statement? The priorities are sort of your objectives. And then the inputs are the resources you need and the capabilities that you have that are going to make this work. The outputs are you know, the programs, all that kind of stuff that you're going to do and then who you're going to reach uh, is your participants and all the, you know, the, the, in, my, in this case, the girls 7 to 14 are going to be, be the people that I reach. Um, but I'm also going to have women in STEM careers that I'm going to be working with. So that, that needs to be in there, too. And then your outcomes, or, or your, your outcomes and impacts. So this is, this is my basic. A is the organization and project's current state of excellence on which to build, right? That's our organizational statement. B is the need or opportunity in the community that needs to be addressed. That's the, um, you know, whatever, whatever the, you know, the, the lack of, of diversity in STEM programs. And so you want to, want to engage students of color. And then uh, C is what the organization and project can do in part partnership with the funder to make that happen. So if you, can, if you can answer those three things in a really simple way, you've got a basic start to how you're going to frame all of this. The last hand, handout that you have is stolen verbatim from a funder in Cincinnati called Ignite Philanthropy. And they sent this out to the people that get grants from them, and I thought, I'm not going to, this is, this is straight out of the funder's mouth. This is what they say they want. Now, granted, this is only one. But still, the, I, I found that the, the, that the 
material was really valid. So proposal writing tips, human element. We talked a little bit already about the storytelling versus the statistics. Of course you want to have some statistics in there, but don't do it at the expense of the storytelling. Have that human element also. Um, if, you, if you go back to that one need statement, I used a chart to show the, the um, graduation rates. It's just easier, and it's, it breaks up the page. Um, pictures, I use pictures of youth in, in, engaged with, with, with visitors all the time for my youth programs, applications. So anything that you can do to remember going back to that, what do people read? They, they, re, they read the headline, the subhead, the pull-out quote, the picture caption, the first paragraph, and maybe the rest of it. So what can you do to grab somebody's attention and, and make it come alive a little bit? Um, concrete and vivid language versus vague conceptual words. Um, provide, engage. Inspire, those are all nice words, but what do they really mean? You know? Um, and I fall into that language because sometimes I can't come up with a better one. But if I can say, uh, I can say um, something about the, the hands-on activities or something like that in a more concrete way. Even hands-on activities is, is vague. What does that mean? Give me an example of it. You know, girls are going to um, practice building paper airplanes and seeing which, one, which, which, strat which designs work better. You know? So they're going to learn about aerodynamics and all that kind of stuff. They're going to have this hands-on thing. That's more interesting than saying girls will, girls, girls will create paper, uh, model air, paper airplanes and, and measure the, 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 way, the way that they fly is much more concrete than engage girls in hands-on activities. So anything that you can do to, to keep it a picture and, and concrete is and active versus passive voice. This is one of my pet peeves. Who's going to do it? Not it will be done. I find academics like to write in passive voice. And I fight this with people. So, um, one seminar that I went to early in my career was adamant that you should never, ever, ever write a sentence more than 20 words long. Go back and look at some of your sentences. I get sentences from people sometimes that are 45, 60 words long. First of all, you can cut a lot of words by going from active to passive. It was done by so-and-so. He did it. You know, that's, that's just a really simple way. So active voice, short sentences, those are the ones that people remember. Cincinnati needs better STEM education, right? That's something that's really short that people can remember. So try to keep your sentences long. As I say, my goal is, is, tw is, is 20 words. And if, if you don't know this, when you're working in, 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 in Word, you can highlight the sentence, and at the bottom of the screen, it'll tell you how many words that sentence is. You can also highlight a paragraph or the whole document, either one. Do spell check, and after it tells you, after it's done all the spell, spell corrections and everything, It'll go to a screen where it'll tell you the reading level. And ex people that do fundraising, particularly like direct mail and that kind of stuff, will say that you should never write above an eighth grade level. Newspapers are supposed to be never above an eight, fifth to eighth grade level. Um, 
I find it really difficult to write at an eighth grade level. But I try really hard to never go over 11 or 12. And you can do that by, instead of saying utilize, say use. You can do that by using active voice instead of passive voice. You can do that by having shorter sentences. And those are all things that go into the algorithm that determines that reading level. So if, if, you're, if you're curious about where, what your current writing style is, use those, use those tools in Word to check and see how long are my sentences? How long, uh, what, what is the, grade, the, the reading grade level of, of that, that goes with that? Um, use simple and familiar words instead of jargon. You can say, instead of saying opportunity, you can, instead of this program gives you an opportunity to do X, you can say this program gives you a chance to do X. It means the same thing. You know, you can say fatherly or you can say paternal, right? They mean basically the same thing. But, but use the, the more common word if, if possible. And then always be kind and have lots of white space. White space is really important, not just to designers, but also to human eyes when they are reading. Think about picking up a book that is one paragraph is the entire page versus three or four shorter paragraphs. Which one do you want to read? You want to read the one that gives you that break. There's something, there's something about that, that little five space indent that just, and, and the white space in between paragraphs that just makes it easier to read. So bottom line, paint pictures for people who don't know what you're doing. Remember that the people who are reading this don't know you. These are, these are guidelines that everybody who's worked on federal stuff knows. Read the directions, read the directions again, read them a third time, and then as you're writing, keep reading them. And then after you've done them all, done everything, go back and read them again and make sure you hit everything. I mean, it's just really important to follow directions. Um, use the headers and language that the funder used. If they say to put it in a certain order, put it in that order. It doesn't really matter if that isn't the order you would have put it in. It matters that that's what they're expecting to see. And so use their headers, use their order, and use their language. Write with your audience in mind. Remember, they don't know you as well as you know you. And they may not know your topic the way you, you know it. And so make it accessible for your audience. Be creative, make it interesting, inspire the re reviewer. This is another one that you know, should be automatic, but make sure if you've got budget numbers or numbers served or any of those things, if there's more than one piece to the project, make sure the numbers are the same everywhere. On the, on the beginning of the form, in the narrative, in the budget, in the budget narrative, whatever. I mean, just make sure that all your numbers match up. Because that's a place that you can look really foolish if they don't. Proofread, and then always have someone else proofread also. Don't just use spell check. <laughs> it doesn't work. And have someone not familiar with your program read it. I mean, if you can get somebody who, you know, I don't care if it's a neighbor or uh, somebody down, you know, down the hall that doesn't really work with you or whatever, but if you can get somebody who doesn't know your program to read it, that will um, be somebody that, that is going to come at it with that fresh eye. And they might find typos that you've missed because you've been reading over them so many times. But they also can say, what did you mean by this? Because it was clear to you, but it may not be clear to them. And be kind to the reviewer. Don't write more than you need to. Oh, I've gone over. I'm bad. Sorry. <laughs> Deb's over there waving at me. 
Yeah, we're a few minutes over, but that's okay. We have lunch that's available right now. Um, if we would have maybe two, three minutes for a couple questions, and then we're going to go ahead and break and set up for our panel lunch discussion out in the hallway. Um, the lunch is out in the hallway. Yes. Yes. Yeah. All we the will send it out. I'll fix that one slide and then um, and then send it to, to Deb so she can send it out. Mm -hmm. I'll send those out via email. And oh yeah, I'm doing all the handouts. I'm doing everything. In addition to that, we're recording this, and the recordings will be available in the next couple of weeks, so you can share it with the broader audience at your universities and institutions. Thank you for your patience, everybody. Thank you.